Let's do it. Awesome, awesome. We're live. Welcome to the Gamification Revolution. I'm Gabe Zickerman coming to you from an unusually sunny but very cold New York City uh, in January. And I'm here with Asi Barak, the co-president of Games for Change. Hi, Asi. Hi, Gabe. Thanks for being here with us. And um, before we get started, uh, for those of you who are interested in gamification and Games for Change, um, you know, G Summit, which is a gamification summit coming up in April, and um, you can uh, register for Gamification Summit at, at gsummit.com and see Aussie speaking there, which will be awesome, along with a bunch of other people. Uh, it's a lot of fun. You, there's some information down below as well as how to ask a question. And uh, we encourage you to ask questions. We'd love to get them answered. So Aussie, tell me this, which is um, so, uh, so very important. What is a game for change? So I think that the game for change is a game that has a purpose that is beyond entertainment. And I would say that the, the overall purpose is um, social good. And social good could go in many directions. You could speak about human rights, and you can speak about climate change, poverty, uh, women equality. Uh, but it could be, you know, very daily mundane things like uh, public health or um, you know, real world events around us or gun control. Um, to me, to me, it's a very broad definition, but it it needs to have this kind of core of you want to make a, the world a better place by saying something, by promoting something, by energizing people to to take action. So it's funny that you brought up gun control because this past week saw probably one of the most controversial things that's come up in the kind of you know in this. Space, which is the NRA, after the shootings at Newtown, after saying games are the cause of violence, uh, releases a game that is intended to help you, uh, I guess, to encourage uh, people to work with the NRA and to encourage gun use and gun ownership, which from their perspective, I guess, is a social good in the way they view the world. How, how do you feel about that kind of stuff? And, how, and can that be part of this equation? Can that kind of stuff be part of the equation? I mean, it's it's interesting because uh, I I have this debate a lot with the indie community, and you know even even the event in Australia that you were part of, so there were some in the indie community in Australia in Games for Change Australia that criticized the event that it didn't have a change agenda, so they were expecting to see a very extreme liberal agenda, you know, against corporations. And why do we bring all those gamification corporations to speak? I, I see it very differently. And, uh, and I think that uh, if the NRA is authentic in making a game that they think is going to change perspective and going to present their point of view, I would probably let them speak at the festival. If it's not promoting anything illegal or something that stands, you know, in a very um, blunt way against the values uh, of you know the United States, I would say that it's part of the debate um, that they can play in the same rules that we play when we make something very progressive, liberal, you know, left-wing uh, uh, propaganda. So that's uh, I mean I think that's an awesome perspective. Um, obviously, people are going to be unhappy. Many people are going to be happy with that, right? Because the vast majority of the discussion, you know, is about like, let's say progressive social change issues. Is the goal, would the goal of having the NRA there be to kind of like learn from their example or are we just making a point about inclusiveness? Like why, why would we want to listen to what the NRA has to say? I think that uh, we're, we're still in early stages in my mind, you know, it's like, uh, um, you know, to me there was another uh, event that was very telling this week. Uh, there was a game, uh, End Game Syria, that was done by a group that, you know, their, their mission is to uh, make those games like on a weekly basis around the news, okay? So, they, of course, they were banned by Apple for the iPhone App Store. And, uh, and when they looked at the guidelines and when Apple communicated with them, they basically told them, if you want to say something about the culture or religion, write a book. Don't make a video game. That's the opposite of what I'm, I'm, I'm believing in and I'm thinking. So the reason I think we should be inclusive is because it's so early 
and we're still making a point about the medium that I think we need multiple voices and we need to show that it can, it can be used in different ways by different people and trigger a great debate. You know, right now the debate of gun control and the NRA uh, versus the, you know, the people that uh, promote gun control, this debate is happening on the TV and on editorials in newspapers right. and on blogs. I want this debate to happen in video games. Why? And computer games. Because I think that, I think that this medium is so much more powerful in, in, in many ways. It's not going to replace traditional media because traditional media is, is very good at telling stories and conveying messages and content. But I think that games can show you things and can let you explore in ways that traditional media cannot. And I had this experience with things that I created where people came to us and said, you know, I understood the issue in a much more profound way by playing your game in five minutes or an hour than I, than I did by listening to the news for hours, days, weeks. So do you think that... And it's because... I mean, do you think that somebody then uh, who makes game experiences like that, do you think they have a greater uh, responsibility then to the people who play them or the world that they're in? I mean, you're describing the techniques or the technology of, of games for change, gamified systems as being more powerful in a way. So is there some greater responsibility that comes with that? I think so. I think that it's, it's also a, a bigger challenge. And I think that that's why you know, that's why we're, we're still struggling and there are not many great examples and it's so difficult to do. I think that, you know, to make a game for change that is really effective, I mean, you need to, you need to design, you need to add sound, you need to add video, you need to add uh, uh, graphics. I mean, you need to control so many disciplines and on top of it, do something that um, the player might surprise you in the way that he's engaging with what you've created or she's engaging so and that is i think that it's a huge challenge and that's kind of hard for creators isn't it like one of the central challenges of being a creator of something even if you're a writer but also certainly of a game designer is if the um, player kind of goes off the rails you're trying to convince them that genocide is bad um and so you expect right. them to play uh, a game in a particular way and then they kind of go the up opposite direction and play it in the wrong way. How, how do you feel like designers of Games for Change, and you're a fairly prolific one, how, how do you feel like you resolve that tension? Do you just have to like talk yourself off a ledge? I mean, what do you do? I mean, I, I'm seeing, let's say that I'm seeing kind of, a, it's, it's obviously a scale, you know, it's, it's a much more nuanced picture than just black and white. But I do see the, the scale goes to either games that are very sharp and they're almost uh, um, editorials and they really, to, to, to answer the challenge that you're raising, what they do is almost they put you in a, in a, in a pen, you know, in, in a place where no matter what choice you'll make, at the, eventually they'll, they'll, they'll convey the message that they want. Um, you know, the classic uh, September 12th, is the most uh, crystallized example where no matter what you'll do you'll shoot a terrorist and they'll come up and you you'll just uh, create many more terrorists just by the, the collateral damage and everything you're doing so th this this is kind of one kind the other kind that i actually am more interested in personally uh, but i think that the, the the organization as a whole would like to see more of are games that are actually showing you the multiple perspectives. Right. So they're not about, you know, hammering you with like, this is what you need to do, or this is the right answer. I think that games are great in, in not giving you the right answers, but letting you, you know, make your own mind based on a very deep experience and make decisions and see the consequences. So, you know, rather than one side of the map making a game about the budget, I would like to see a game that realistically giving you the opportunity to to test your own assumptions with the budget. So, um, and we're here with Asi Barak, co-president of Games for Change uh, on the Gamification Revolution. Uh, great to have all of you here. Neil's uh, 
talks about how games are great at letting you play the other role. And that's actually kind of my sort of one question that I have for you about a design pattern that, uh, you know, I kind of am curious about. So I, I played a lot of this game called Civilization. And so, so in Civilization, you have the ability to wage nuclear war against your foes. And it usually comes kind of late in the game. And at that point, you've struggled a lot and you've got relationships, you've been at peace with some people who've developed all these technologies. And you've often played for hundreds of hours at the point that you get to this moment in the game. And I remember really distinctly, you know, you get to that point and suddenly you develop nuclear weapon capability. And now you can, from the comfort of your city, blow up your opponents without risking any, um, you know, without risking any of your military um, uh, assets in the game. So, of course, you do it. Right? Now, what you find when you do it in the game is that when you try to wage war against another country, so when you try to blow them up, if you're a democracy or republic, uh, the Senate opposes you. And so you have to change to a dictatorship before being able to actually wage the war you want to. When you blow the other right. city up, when you blow the other country up, um, every country in the world declares war against you, even the ones who have been your allies for many right. years. So the whole world aligns against you. Then you can march into the cities unopposed, but uh, the people who live there, it takes a long time for them to accept you as their legitimate leader. So they oppose you for a long time and you create massive pollution that takes a really long time to clean up. So it's obvious from these mechanics what Sid Meier thinks about nuclear war. He made his opinion very, very clear. What he didn't do, and this is my question for you, what he didn't do was throw up a screen when you try to blow, use the nuclear weapon. It says, hey, wait a minute, nuclear weapons are really bad. If you do this thing, right. uh, all kinds of bad stuff will happen. You don't really want to do this, do you? That would be crazy. He didn't do that at all. He let the character, right. lets the player do it and then learn the consequences. And what a clear lesson for me. How do we, so, so how do you accomplish something like that? If we all agree that that's a better method and I, that's open for discussion. Mm -hmm. How do we accomplish something like that when we've got like, when the money, for example, for a project like that might be coming from an anti-nuclear uh, warfare organization. Again, I, I mean, it's it's uh, we're kind of uh, in a in a tough territory. I I think that it's not necessarily that if they make an editorial game that is very very sharp and and smart, they're not going to succeed. And I don't think that they're going to probably create the, the game you're speaking about, the civilization, uh, consequences, having this neutral perspective that shows you, yeah, you can do that. It's giving you the tools, um, but you know, you might be surprised with what happens and you might understand things that you didn't understand before you took the action. Um, so, so I think that there are, there are people that at the end of the day, We'll, we'll have to choose kind of the old way of, you know, give, giving you a, a very clear message by, again, I wish they'll do it in a creative way and not with uh, throwing the pop-up that you spoke about. One thing that I see a lot, and I'm sure that you see it as well, when I meet people that are not gamers or that, uh, you know, they don't play games or they don't necessarily, uh, they never designed games, but they want to make a games for change, and I'm sure it's true for gamification, is that they don't understand what you just described uh, in the deep sense. They don't understand that at the end of the day, games are strong at showing you and giving you a lesson through exploration and consequences. Um, what, they, what they think that they should do is just like they do in, in a textbook, they think that they should tell you. And they think that they should tell you with a text and they should tell you with the uh, right and wrong. Um, I think this is something that, that we should really avoid. Um, but again, the editorial is fine. The editorial could be fun. How, so how, but what about that tension? And by the way, if you've got uh, questions, uh, lots of interesting comments popping up in the thread, but if you have questions for Asi or me, just feel free to click the submit a question button and we'll get to them. Um, how do, but how do we resolve that tension like with the actual payers. Like I, I had a conversation with a, a zoology uh, institute, a government institution who wanted to make a kind of a game for change around uh, climate change and the loss of species. And so my first reaction, I've kind of started to do this as a litmus test when people want to talk to me about it. I'm like, okay, so what if the best way to make this game to accomplish this idea 
is that the player gets to destroy all the species on Earth by changing the climate. Instead of trying to save them, their actual objective is to destroy them. So they learn the, um, the kind of perspective on it. And the look of shock and horror on her face said volume. And then she, and then it took like a, a half a minute, and she said, "I don't think we could get that approved." Now, how do we? I right. mean, so how do you resolve that, or do you even think that we need to resolve that? Does that even matter? Yeah, I think, I think that one thing we need to do is is be more articulate, and 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 it's tough, and and put more um, in in cases like this. Bring with us research, and and examples, um, so, for example, one, one thing that we, we've done in the past, we spoke about failure. And uh, we spoke about the idea that learning, many times, the best learning happens through failure and failing in a, in a safe environment. So, th there was a series of games around climate change in, in our community. And what we started seeing is that the students that played this game, in the first five, ten minutes, what they did was actually melting the planet. So they took the most extreme actions that bring you to the you know, terrible end fastest, as fast as they could. But there was a lesson there because they tested the boundaries. And again, that's what, what games are great at doing. And if maybe, maybe the person you spoke with could not be convinced, but maybe this is a, an approach to tell her, look, that's not going to be, be the way to win the game. But it's something we don't want to, to, you know, forbid players from doing. You know, we made a peace game, a conflict resolution game, that you could assassinate everybody, everybody you want. But you, the consequences were just very, very tough. And, and, right? and to me, it, just like you described. Yeah, yeah. And to me, it seems like a lot of the important learning, right, happens in that moment. So. An interesting question from Andrew, and you know, Asi, you're so um, you, know, you have such a like obvious, um, obviously incredibly uh, experienced perspective on this. I'm interested in kind of these more uh, ethical questions that are coming up. So I, I'm I'm interested in this question and, and what you think about it. So what about kind of the morality of this of some of this stuff? Like, is there a, a moral side? Obviously, there's a lot of discussion about the you know the morality of game violent, you know, games as they relate to gun violence, but even in the context of making games for change or gamified systems where we allow people to do things like play with death, do we have an obligation, does the designer have an obligation to uh, somehow qualify that? Or does that feed into some desensitization about, uh, about life? I, I think we must, you know, it's, it's one of those areas that they think we're very weak when I say we, you know, it's like, it's not games for change, it's not gamification, it's the whole space, the whole industry. I think we're very, very weak in being able to connect you um, in, a, in a deep emotional way, uh, doing things that are, um, you know, making you feel uncomfortable. I'm not saying that there are not good examples, but it's almost like you can write a list of the good examples and put them, you know, in, in a blog. Um, while in movies, you have it in almost every, every product. Um, I think that uh, we're not exploring enough. I think we're, not, we're, we're playing it safe. Um, I think the indie movement is doing much more there, but unfortunately, these are not a big budget in the industry. Um, and, and again, I mean, because it's interactive, because you make decisions, it's so much more powerful than just watching someone else going through a moral dilemma um, and again instead of telling you what's right and wrong i wish that the, the game would show you you know and we let you play the wrong path we let you go in the wrong path and see the consequences that would be amazing uh, that, there's a great question and uh, a great answer thanks for that andrew and so my follow-on question for you actually and then i, I want to talk about some of the cool other stuff that you're doing uh, my follow-on question for you is how do we get people to play in the first place i, I wonder about the kind of earnestness of a lot of, uh, you know, ex like games that try to change behavior or games for change, you know, when the headline of the product is, um, you know, what's wrong with genocide or, you know, uh, solving the environmental crisis in the world or whatever, how do you get people who are not, don't think that that sounds like a lot of fun on a weekend uh, to actually pick this experience right. up in the first place? Um, wouldn't we be better off making things where the message was less in your face? 
I think that, I mean, the more I'm, uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. And it's one of the biggest gaps that I see in, in what we're doing. And, um, and again, I think, I think what you're doing is probably a bit suffering from the same, um, uh, the same challenges, even though sometimes corporations might have much bigger budgets, but the idea of get, getting the games to the hands of people, huge issue. And, um, and I think that what you're mentioning is just one of the reasons it doesn't happen enough. Another reason is that we don't have publishers. We don't have, uh, you know, we're not working with publishers in the commercial industry and publishing, you know, by your own is, is a huge challenge. Um, the more I'm, I'm seeing things, the more I'm, I'm uh, looking at, at successes and failures, I think that there are two ways. One is be commercial, like work with commercial partners. We're trying to do it now with Zynga and Intel. Just, you know, do it big. I mean, work with the people that know how to get to, to you know, to players. And when you do that, you will have to get your message across in a different way. I mean, naturally, when you work with people like that, you won't be able to make your do-goodery game with the do-goodery title. The other way, for those that want to stay very on cause, very, you know, explicit and literal, the distribution, I think, should be completely different. And that means that they should go and do it high touch, uh, interventions that are very, very deep, whether it's uh, non-profits that are working in communities, schools, because the context there, and I, and I always said it, it's like your competition is completely different. You're not competing with commercial games and an amazing experience. You're competing with textbooks. And there, you know, an average game is already yeah, ahead of the, of the curve. Natural advantage. And, um... Awesome. And we're talking here on Gamification Revolution with Asi Barak, co-president of Games for Change. And you can come see Asi and me and a bunch of other people at G-Summit in April in San Francisco. It's gsummit.com. And, um, and there's a cool code you can use down below uh, to save some money on your passes and, and get a spot in the workshop. And so, Asi, you, you kind of touched on it. And I want you to tell people a little bit more about, speaking of doing it big, you've been working on this project called Half the Sky uh, for some time, which is you know, right. maybe the biggest project in uh, Games for Change ever. Yeah. Uh, why don't you tell everyone about yeah. Half the Sky? It's so cool. So, so Half the Sky, and, and we'll talk about it at the, at the summit, and the, hopefully by then I, I could really show uh, positive results from, uh, from some of the things we're launching. But it started with Nick Christoph. Nicholas Christoph, if you want to say that someone is Mr. Social Good or Social Change, it's Nicholas Christoph. And uh, is the uh, is writing in the New York Times, uh, uh, op-ed writer, Pulitzer Prize winner, and uh, just on Twitter as an example, he has one million three hundred thousand followers uh, for a reporter. And so he came to Games for Change and he said, "Look, guys, I'm doing this. Uh, I'm writing this book, which, by the way, since then came out and became number one bestseller on." on the New York Times list. And he said, I'm making this TV series that also came out and it, it's a very acclaimed, uh, it's a two night show on PBS that reached millions of people, amazing uh, ratings for uh, something so uh, difficult. And the topic is women empowerment and women oppression. And some of the issues are so difficult to watch in this TV show and reading about it in the book. And he said, OK, we're doing those amazing things. And that was even before. But I'm, I feel like I'm speaking to the same people, more or less. Uh, obviously, it's great. And we're mobilizing people that care. But we're not reaching people that don't care. And then he came to the idea of making the games. And since then, and I'll be happy to tell you more about it if, if, if it's of interest, we actually made four games. Uh, the fourth, the Facebook game, kind of the big investment is coming in March, but we also made three mobile games for India and Kenya. So it was a very interesting experiment, almost like going in a time machine and developing games for very early mobile devices. And each one of those games needed to be less than 200 kilobytes because you need to download them over the, over the network in a very simple right. device. And um, 
we just this week just you know just to show you that uh, some feedback or is already coming and it's very very satisfying uh, we made a pregnancy game on the mobile as one of the three and it's called nine minutes and it's trying to answer a huge problem with pregnancy in india and kenya that women are not following what for you in the west might be the most uh, natural and obvious things to do uh, not smoking going to the clinic uh, delivery at the hospital and the reason they don't do it is, is cultural norms but sometimes you know it's objective it's very expensive to do those things and, and they don't they don't uh, think they're important enough anyway nine minutes you play the pregnancy cycle in nine minutes so every one minute is one month and the evaluation report that we got this week from 900 pregnant women with their husbands is really really powerful and many of them that had almost no clue about what they need to do during pregnancy after playing one session with the game came with so much more knowledge and positive attitudes that again it shows you the power and and it's just about making more of those so let me ask you quick because i i i mean this is so exciting right this is like being able to reach people and changing uh you know starting the process of changing behavior does it matter to you that either from this start point that either it goes from 900 people to 90 million people, right, if we're using the Kenya example, or that we follow up with the women, uh, you know, a year later and see how they actually progress. And, and I know it's important to you, so I don't mean for that to be like, do you care about it? Because obviously you care about it. The question is, how do we actually make that from a good case study in a small group of people into an actual thing that really changes behavior on a large scale? Right. So, so this project specifically is all about scale. Um, so it, it's, it's almost the brief from Nick Christoph was, I want to reach millions of people. So the evaluation was on 900 people, but the distribution that we're doing is on the uh, most dominant app stores in India and Kenya. So already we have dozens of thousands playing, but we're also in final stages with uh, Disney in India and Safaricom in Kenya to promote the games and really get them to the scale that they deserve. On the Facebook game, same idea. We went to the best in the industry, we went to Zynga, and, um, and through those partnerships, we hope to get to, it's almost like we found our publishers. So obviously they never did it before, so for them it's a learning curve, how to think about it, how to leverage it in the press, because this is obviously what's important for someone like that is, is involved. Um, but this is the way to get to millions of people. I can't expect them to download it. And one more thing I want to mention is the idea that, uh, and, and to me, this is the only way to reach scale, is that we released this version, it must be just the first version. So now we're already in a, in a process of phase two, because if you think about it, if you look at the commercial industry, the big successes are about Call of Duty 1, Call of Duty 2, Call of Duty 3. It's not because they're lazy, or at least not only because they're lazy, because they built an engine and they improve it every time. And this is what I think we should do more in, in Games for Change. If we did those three games and it's the first version, let's see how people play them. Let's see what works, let's see what doesn't. Let's see what distribution channels work. Let's scale them up. Let's continue to invest money in the project. Let's figure out how we make some revenue. Let's figure out from the Facebook game how we make it sustainable. Tough questions, yeah. but this, this is the way to how, go. Um, so one last question for you, because we're you know, sort of almost out of time. If, if, there's one, uh, uh, if there's one thing that you could uh, ask from the games industry, who you know, dipping their toes in the water with you a little bit, but you know, not embracing making games for change all the time. And I have my own thesis about why that is having to do with some deep-seated libertarianism. What's the one thing that you think would really help advance this, uh, this movement forward? What do we need more than anything else from games? I think that uh, what, 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 uh, what Zynga was doing with us is very interesting. So. So Zynga has a new uh, uh, head for Zynga.org called uh, Ken Weber. Uh, and Ken also joined our board recently, which is, which is a great thing to have someone like that from the commercial industry. But the idea that he brought in, I think, could be replicated 
he started this thing he calls Studio G, okay? Studio for good. And what he did, he doesn't have like full-time employees, you know, that left everything they do at Zynga and, and start to make answer change. But they invest some of their time. And they do some in-kind advising, evaluate, evaluating. This is what I think the game companies should do. If you think about it, they have social responsibility. All of them are contributing to society. But they, have, they do it with no connection to games. If they could get their employees, that many of them are bored, many of them want to do something for good, many of them are tired of doing the same thing, get this talent to help you, to help us, to help making games that are looking differently. So a little bit of, a little you know? bit of support and, and, from the, using the talent and using the resources, a little bit of support from the awesome creative well that's games and probably from the corporations uh, so engaged in gamification also would be useful. And, and to that end, we're out of time for today. But I want to thank Asi, Barak, and Games for Change, and be sure to check out Half the Sky. You can follow Games for Change on Twitter at G4C, which is the number four in between, really easy to follow. Um, and you can come see Asi and me and a bunch of other great folks at G Summit in April. Uh, on behalf of everyone, thanks for watching the Gamification Revolution. Keep having fun. Thank you very much, Kate.